welcome uh, everyone. We're here today for a very important uh, seminar and it has been requested uh, specifically by the ECES and uh, it was uh, a particular uh, request uh, given to uh, the IMF uh, asking for this this specific uh, advisor. I heard his presentation in Jordan and I thought uh, that it was an imperative to listen to it here so that we can deal with this critical subject. Um, I do not want to be lengthy. I want to give him the space to speak in details. I'll start with the uh, introduction. Mr. Javier Rami. He is a public financial management advisor um, uh, of the Regional Assistance Bureau. He has over 20 years of expertise in public financial management advisor. He worked um, uh, with the IMF and uh, provided uh, technical assistance in different uh, African and Asian uh, countries. Um, uh, he assumed uh, many prestigious positions uh, and he is a lecturer uh, um, uh, of uh, public financial management. Um, so we're speaking about pure expertise on public financial management from head to toe. On my uh, left hand side sits um, the re representative uh, of the IMF uh, here and he worked uh, in uh, Romania's uh, office and he was uh, the head of the uh, financial uh, policies uh, and the IMF uh, assumed different positions in uh, uh, Jamaica, Greek, um, Ukraine. Uh, he, ha he has a lot of publications. Mr. Ahmad Kojok. He is the uh, deputy of the ministry, Minister of uh, Finance. He previously assumed many prestigious positions in the Ministry of Economics uh, uh, and uh, the American University in um, Egypt. And he has m many publications. After the introduction, Mr. Khafi is going to give his uh, presentation. And then we are uh, going to listen to Mr. Ahmad Khojok uh, about what we're doing here in Egypt. Uh, we do not have any media representation here, uh, particularly in order to talk openly with uh, uh, transparency. We're not uploading the government, but uh, we are trying to improve uh, our uh, way of managing things. Shukran, Dr. Rablas Balkhir. Uh, very good morning. It is a great pleasure to welcome honorable members of parliament, Vice Minister Ahmed Kujur and other distinguished guests to this event that we organize with the ECES on a topic that is extremely important. I wanted to, in my welcoming remarks, talk about two very brief points. Um, the first is to put this in the context of the IMF's work in Egypt, the relationship that the IMF has with Egypt. A lot that you hear about the IMF in media is with regards to the loan that is supporting the government's reform program. And that is indeed important. But an equally important part of our relationship, if not more important, is with regards to technical assistance, which gets less coverage in media, but is independent of the loan and the program. This technical assistance that we have been providing in a number of different areas seeks to bring together international best practices taken, taking into account country-specific considerations. It produces a series of recommendations. These are not conditions, but these are recommendations and a plan for the authorities to consider 
to address the issues that they face. This has a longer time span than the life of a loan program and over the past, um, the time that I have been here over the past one year and before, uh, we have been supporting technical assistance in a number of areas such as budget preparation and execution, uh, fiscal transparency, strengthening revenues through reforms in the ETA, and also in non-fiscal areas such as statistics and central bank supervision and changes to the central bank law. And the event today is an example of the way in which we can support a country's reform efforts in technical assistance. And indeed, Xavier, who kindly agreed to come from our regional training center in Beirut, Meta, has led one of the technical assistance missions before to Egypt. Now, while technical assistance is another way, uh, important part of our relationship, the third important point that I want to mention with regards to the role of the IMF is the analysis that we produce at a regional and national level. So if you are interested in how Egypt compares to other countries in specific areas, such analytical products, papers and reports that we produce allow us to communicate this analysis to you and specifically on the topic that we are discussing today, budget transparency, such products allow us to also communicate the progress that Egypt has made over the last few years compared to other countries. So, um, and this in fact is the second point that I want to make in my welcome remarks is with regards to the reforms that have been undertaken in Egypt. The Honorable Vice Minister will be talking about this more in his presentation, but for my part, I just wanted to make two big picture points. One is that if you take a step back and look from a longer term perspective, the amount of information being made available today with regards to publication of budget related documents, both for the preparation phase as well as the execution phase, you compare what is happening now to what was happening earlier between 2011 to 2014. And there is a very marked improvement in the dissemination and communication of that information. So that's the first point that I wanted to make. And, and a second point that I wanted to make is with regards to the establishment of a fiscal transparency unit in the Ministry of Finance. And, and this unit will go a long way to institutionalize some of the reforms that have already been undertaken. Let me stop here, but just I will mention to you that um, I am based here in Egypt and it would be my pleasure and honor to be able to continue this conversation with you in any form that I can and to be able to provide you with any information that you may be interested in with regards to the IMF's work in Egypt, as well as the IMF's views more regionally. Thank you. Let me welcome Javier for what I hope will be a useful and a important presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reza. I'm sorry I don't speak Arabic, so I will uh, speak English this morning. As I said by Reza a few minutes ago, I'm part of the technical assistance of the IMF. Uh, usually we are the smiling face of the IMF, we are not providing uh, hard conditions, we are providing advice to our membership, our best technical advice, it's recommendation, and it's up to the country to implement the recommendation we are providing. I'm currently based in Beirut, in Lebanon, and I'm covering, as you can see on this map, 14 countries of the region, from Morocco to Afghanistan and from Djibouti to Syria. And uh, I'm very grateful to Dr. Abla to have set up this meeting. We met in Jordan uh, a few months ago and we had an extensive discussion on the question of uh, transparency. I've been working on this topic extensively in many parts of the world, South America in Brazil, for instance, a lot in Africa, but also in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And I think that in the region, we have a real challenge regarding this topic. This graph is based on uh, the data provided by uh, an international survey prepared by a civil society organization called the International Budget Partnership. Every two years, 
they reviewed the, co the conditions of uh, budget transparency in one 112 countries around the world. And they have a mechanism to score the condition of budget transparency. This graph shows you what is the situation for the MENA region. And it gives you a few information. The first one is that if you take a look at the overall performance in the MENA region, it's the worst region in the world. I did not provide it the comparison with other parts of the world. But when you take a look at the average scores of the country in the region, it's twice below what Sub-Saharan Africa is performing. Meaning, we have a huge deficit in terms of fiscal transparency. Okay, but to be cautious on this, in uh, 2015 you had a change in the methodology, so you have always to be cautious about the numbers. No, so the regional picture is quite bleak in the region, and being a regional advisor, it's uh, one of the key issues the IMF is eager to address in this part of the world. Uh, second aspect, when you focus on Egypt, as you can see, uh, the dark blue is uh, the 2015 survey, the light blue is the 2017 survey. So in Egypt, we have experienced, uh, as also stressed by Reza, a very impressive increase in the scoring of the survey. So I would just touch on a few topics. First, I will uh, quickly introduce why uh, we consider that fiscal transparency is an important topic. I will then introduce a few points on uh, international standards in this area. Also discuss the challenges based on the experience we have in this area in achieving fiscal transparency. It's not easy. And uh, just to touch a little bit on the question of the parliament and budget oversight. So first, the definition. So at the IMF, we do not talk about budget transparency most of the time. We talk about fiscal transparency. So you have a distinction in English. And uh, mostly, the fiscal provide a broader scope of public finance. So we are mostly interested, and we'll get back to this later, we are interested in the broader picture of public finance, and we do not focus only on the budget of the central government. And it's an important point, and I will show you a few examples in a few minutes of why it matters. When we talk about fiscal transparency, uh, we are interested in mostly three key dimensions. The first one is the question of availability of information. And when we say availability, it's on not only availability for the general public, but in many countries there are being information available for the decision makers, being the Ministry of Finance, being the line ministries, being the policy makers. And uh, based on my experience, it's very difficult in many contexts to be able to get a clear picture of the situation. I know that Reza has been involved with Greece at some point, but my colleagues from the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF dealing with Greece at the, point, at the same time had always a challenge to assess what was the real size of the debt in Greece at some point. And it was creating a lot of issues in terms of fiscal management and assessing what we could do in the country. The second aspect of transparency is the ability to access the information. So you still have many countries where accessing basic information on the budget remains a challenge. You know, you have to go to the Ministry of Finance, provide your ID, the ID is photocopied, and then you have to pay to get a copy of uh, the pages of the budget. I guess it's not, anymore, uh, not the case in Egypt, but... <laughs> in many countries, the access remains a challenge. And the access is not about just the physical access or the access to the information. It's also the accessibility of the information in terms of what a normal citizen or a normal lawmaker is able to understand from the information. You know, I've been working in countries where you have a 200, 200 pages uh, budget full of tables and nobody is able to understand what it means, you know, full of codes and so on. So the accessibility is also about providing information that are usable for different kinds of users and tailored to their needs. And the last aspect is the question of quality. Information are interested, but you need to provide a reasonable insurance regarding the quality of information because you will have to base your uh, decision on information. And also, we see in the region especially, we still have a lot of challenges regarding the quality of information provided by the government. So, 
Why fiscal transparency matters? First, uh, it's an issue, as I mentioned, within the government. The government needs to have intelligible information, actionable information to make decisions. But it's also a question of relationship with uh, the different stakeholders of public finance. Parliament, of course, but also the public. And we have seen a lot of progress in Egypt with uh, citizens' guides and uh, additional information provided for the needs of the general public. And in many countries that have market access, the relationship they have with the markets. And we've seen a lot of uh, studies recently showing the correlation or the relationship between uh, openness and transparency and the uh, yield of their interest rates. I said that we are talking about fiscal transparency at the IMF and not only about budget transparency. And I will show you four examples. They are not coming from Egypt, but from uh, countries we've been working with to try to explain why we try to get a broader picture of public finance and why it matters. So this one is coming from uh, an African country. What you can see in uh, gray is the part of the budget, of the fiscal information that are provided in the budgetary documentation. So you can see you have central government, which is quite useful. Most of the time, it's the scope of the budget and representing 31% of the GDP. It's a country where the government is playing a key role in terms of uh, public expenditure. But if you take a look at what's going on, you don't have a full picture of uh, the central government. You still have a part of the central government which is not covered by the budget documentation for many reasons, including the fact that you have autonomous funds, autonomous bodies that are in place. Sorry. Okay. And then you have uh, local governments, that represent 5% of the expenditure in the country. And you have 14% of the GDP that is uh, delivered in terms of public expenditure by public corporations. So what it means, it means that when the parliament or the citizens are looking at the budget, they are missing about 40% of the total fiscal activities. Meaning you don't really know what's going on in the country in terms of public finance, and in terms of the way you fund and deliver the public policies. That's why more and more we put the emphasis on trying to get a broader picture about the public sector as a whole and to get additional information to understand what's going on not only with just the budget but what's going on with uh, the public corporations, what's going on with the subnational governments. So it's important in terms of fiscal transparency to look beyond the sole budget. You have to try to understand what is going on in the overall public sector because at the end of the day, all these components of the public sector are interacted. And also, they are created a risk for the budget. The second aspect, which is uh, gaining more and more uh, traction uh, over, I would say, the last 20 years in many countries, is the question of the wealth of the government. Uh, for a long time, and it's part of the budgetary tradition, the focus has been put on mostly revenue and expenditures, meaning you are interested in the flows. You look at the flows, and the parliament is looking at the flows mostly. But what also is important is to discuss the balance sheet aspect, meaning the assets and the liabilities, what uh, you control, and uh, the way you, uh, and what you owe to your debtors. And another example of a country which is quite interesting um, it's not very clear, but in light gray, you can see what is reported in terms of liabilities and assets, and in the red, what is not reported. And mostly in this country, what is reported is uh, the part of the financial debt, which is uh, of the general government. You don't have real reporting of assets and large and reported liabilities, especially the one arising from uh, the public corporation and from budgetary entities. So meaning you don't really know what's the situation in terms of wealth of the nations. What are the impact of the decision you are making today on the liabilities and the assets of the government? We just uh, published a study on this topic at the IMF. It was part of a document we call the Fiscal Monitor. It has been published during the IMF and, and World Bank annual meetings uh, a few weeks ago. And it provides a lot of interesting information about why we need to focus today more and more on the way we use this. And also, something which is important for decision makers, your assets and your liabilities, of course, but your assets are the tools you have to deliver the public policies. So it's important to understand what are your assets, what's the quality of these assets, 
and what is the adequation between the liabilities you have created and the way you have been able to develop assets to produce public policies. Another aspect which is quite important when we talk about the fiscal situation is to have a look at the fiscal forecast. And uh, this is the case coming from a Central American country, which is a quite advanced country in many regards of fiscal transparency. And we took a look at the deviation we have uh, and the source of fiscal forecast error between initial budget and executed budget. And it was very interesting in this context to see that we have most of the time a very sharp increase of the executed budget between the initial uh, assessment. So for instance, uh, wages have been un underestimated by mostly 13% in this case, and the cost of local governments, mostly subsidies provided to local governments and parastatal funds, are also around 13.6%. Uh, uh, so knowing what's the quality of the forecast is something which is important, should be part of the debate between the parliament and the government, and also with uh, the broader citizens. In this case, it's quite interesting to see that uh, the wages are increasing in such a dynamic way. Uh, most of the time, wages are very rigid expenditure. Once you have increased your overall envelope of wages, it's very difficult to cut back. So you are creating long-term liabilities for the government and long-term commitments for the budget, uh, while at the same time you can see that the capital expenditure has been underperforming in terms of implementation. Last thing which is important is to understand the fiscal risks. The budget is a document where the government, in the best case, provides its best assumptions about what will happen, what will be the total revenues, what will be the expenditure, based on the best information they have at the time they table the budget. But it's also important to understand what are the risks around that could adversely affect or positively affect the way you will implement your budget. And we talk, for instance, in this case, about key fiscal risk related to what we call contingent liabilities, meaning it's not a debt, it's not a formal debt, but if an event occurs, it will create an expenditure for the government. So the usual example, in this case, it's a guarantees, meaning the government has provided a guarantee to public corporations or to subnational government to get into a loan with uh, the banking sector. You have also guarantees uh, to the central bank, and you have also large liabilities from public corporations that if they materialize, will be taken over by the government. In many countries, it's the case in Egypt, you have critical public corporations that cannot get burst, meaning uh, you will have to support the electricity provider, you will have to support the uh, corporation uh, providing services like water sanitation. So you have to understand what's the situation and how this situation could impact the budget of the government in the coming uh, months. So regarding the international standards, um, I would say that the last, uh, since the Asian crisis, almost 20 years now, a uh, lot of things have happened in this area. Uh, the Asian crisis was, uh, uh, I would say, revealed uh, the weaknesses of the overall framework to assess and to understand what was going on with the situations of government and countries. Uh, we had a lot of weaknesses, both in public and private financial reporting. Um, uh, we had the, not a clear understanding of the linkages between both the public and the private sector. So at the time of the f Asian crisis, we had a general movement that started to try to improve the overall global framework for understanding what's going on. So you had the first, uh, the IMF code and manual on fiscal transparency, so it was 20 years ago, I guess we should celebrate uh, it at some point. Um, you had also the OECD working on best practices for budget transparencies for uh, its membership. Um, you have a lot of developments around the statistical standards. And you have also the emergence of accounting standards for the public sector. It's called the International Public Sector Accounting Standards. It's a set of uh, standards that provide information about how you should prepare financial statements from the central government as you for the government as you prepare the financial statement of a corporation. At the same time, you have the development of uh, many <coughs> different frameworks to monitor fiscal transparency from multilateral initiatives like uh, the report uh, on standards and code, what we call the ROSCs, 
the fiscal transparency evaluation of the IMF, for instance. A uh, lot of regional bodies also playing a key role. In uh, Europe, the uh, key player is Eurostat, because at the end of the day, they make the decision on how you will qualify if something is a debt or an expenditure. Um, you have a lot of work in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about regional harmonization, with more surveillance at the level of the region, the economic region. And also in the, uh, say the recent period, we have the emergence of a very active movement within the civil society, including a survey like the one I mentioned, I used a few minutes ago, uh, the open budget survey. So you have a stronger, I would say, uh, framework, international framework to be used to improve fiscal transparency with standards. And I always advise my member countries to refer to the standards. I've been working in a country where we are, I guess, some of the smartest people in the world, and we always like to invent national standards. But at the end of the day, using the technology that has been developed by other people, save money, save time, and allows, allows us to uh, benefit from uh, other countries' experience. I mentioned the 2014 Fiscal Transparency Code of the IMF. So we made an update. The first version was in 98, and we had to make an update mostly to take into account the lessons learned during the great financial crisis. Um, so I won't go into the detail, but um, <coughs> the question, you can refer to the document. You will have the link at the end of this presentation. Um, I guess we uh, want to emphasize a few key aspects. I already mentioned them. The first one, uh, when we developed the new code, and I was part of the team, uh, the first thing is to have a look at the full public sector picture. It's important. Don't just focus on the budget. Take a look at what's going on outside the budget. It was uh, one of the key issues in many European countries where you had large liabilities in public corporations, large liabilities in private public partnerships that at some point materialized and trigger a kind of heavy crisis for the public finance. But also link from uh, contingent liabilities like what are the risks created by the banking sector? When you take a look at the materialization of some financial crisis as an impact on public finance, it can be really severe. So it's important to take a look at the quality of the risk management of the banking sector and its potential impact for the government. Because even if you don't have a commitment to support your banks, in many countries you don't have the choice. They are systemic, they are important, and you will have to act. It was the case in Ireland, it was the case in Iceland where the banks created a very heavy burden on the public finance. So one aspect already mentioned this also is the question of being able to understand your balance sheet. Not only the debt, which is usually what we uh, take a look at, but also to understand what's the structure of your assets, what are the structures of uh, your non-financial liabilities. Reporting, and uh, uh, it's important, it's to provide more line reporting with uh, the international standard. Monthly reporting uh, on expenditure is useful. Having uh, audited financial statements at the end of the fiscal year is important, meaning playing with uh, part of the role of parliament in many countries to work with the supreme audit institution to get information about what's the quality of the accounts prepared by the government. And in some countries, it's really important, like in Brazil, where the president was impeached on issues raised by the Court of Accounts on the way they uh, uh, circumvent the fiscal rules in the country. <coughs> and last, uh, something also which is uh, important, I mentioned the question of accessibility. You have to provide information about how the different documents are just working together. Statistics, budget, financial accounts. It's not easy to use, but you have different concepts in place, so it's uh, always a key issue to be able to make the link between the different kind of information you are provided and to provide explanation. And I guess in Egypt we have a very strong uh, way to approach this through the citizen's budget. So this being said, it's a challenge in many countries to achieve fiscal transparency. Uh, we have a lot of aspects of non-transparency that are uh, at play. The first one, you have the usual issue about partial information. You present net expenditure, which is the, but you don't know what are the size of the expenditure or the gross expenditure. You don't have information on off-budget entities. And in some cases, they could be very significant, creating significant expenditure for the government. 
And also, you don't have information on assets and liabilities. Uh, it's always a challenge to develop this kind of information. It takes time. But uh, there are kind of roadmaps uh, to develop this and to, uh, over the time, make it more comprehensive in the way you disclose this information. The second aspect is a question of information that is difficult to understand. You have to prepare information in a way that allows them to be used. Uh, information that are not available on the internet are not really useful. Because nobody will access them today. They have sometimes to be on the paper, but you, know, you need to make them really accessible to the users. And the last uh, thing about the aspects of non-transparency is the question of uh, weaknesses in accounting rules. You know, you can sell assets and treat this as revenue to improve uh, your deficit. You have many tricks for uh, all the people who have been involved in budget uh, matters uh, to make sure you will meet your targets, whatever the targets. Uh, and whatever the system of public finance you use, you have always uh, tricks that could be in place. Um, it's interesting to be able to understand the operation and to see what are their impact. <coughs> Regarding the challenges, uh, we have a few of them. Uh, the first one is the being able to gather the information. It seems easy, but uh, I've been working on this for years. It's a real challenge. Even in a country like mine, where we have a very old and well-organized uh, system, it's difficult because you have uh, IT system issues, you have a lot of practical issues, not only willingness, but really practical and technical issues to be able to gather the information, to centralize it, to make it accessible. Uh, quality of data, it's a challenge uh, most of, uh, in most of the country I've seen, uh, both in terms of uh, quality of the data themselves, but also on the way you collect them. And then you have, I would say, uh, more political issues. The first one is what uh, many people fear, it's a, a question of what we call media negativity. Uh, meaning, when you put information in the public, uh, you have always a kind of fear that it will be used in a way that will not uh, be uh, very uh, supportive of your reform effort. So, it means that you have uh, to do the extra mile and to explain. You know, it's like in the private sector, when a bank or a, a private corporation is providing its financial statements, they do a lot of efforts in terms of financial communication to try to convey the right message and to uh, shape the message they want to address. So it's part of the work. But also it's uh, part of the work of the Ministry of Finance to provide, uh, I would say, the training, the information to the users of the, the information. I remember uh, 10 years ago I was meeting with uh, the French uh, Finance Commission at the Parliament it was the time we produced the first uh, accrual accounting uh, statements for the French government. And nobody was really able to understand the information we are providing. So we, have to sp we had to spend a few weeks to just train the staff of the Finance Commission and work with the key players within the Commission, the key members of the Parliament involved in these affairs, to be able to convey the message, help them to analyze the information, give them the tools to understand the information and the way they can uh, use it. So I think it's a kind of win-win relationship uh, when we want to overcome this kind of challenge. So why countries want to achieve uh, more fiscal transparency? I guess Mr. Yeah. Kutfuk will provide uh, the Egyptian experience, but what we can see is uh, we have a traction which is related to the development of uh, democratic systems where you want to have a more open public debate. Um, <coughs> Most of the time, the real traction is the outcome of crisis, meaning you are, you are eaten by a heavy crisis, so you have to take a look at the information that are available, and you are trying to put in place mechanisms to ensure fiscal discipline and to improve the scrutiny on information. External players are also important. I guess the IMF in some countries is trying to... Uh, we improve uh, fiscal transparency because uh, we consider it's a key issue. But also in countries that have market access, it's a question of relationship with the market and also the rating agencies. Rating agencies are looking at a set of information and uh, they will just make you pay if you are less transparent. It will have an impact on your interest rates. 
And then you have the question of uh, large corruption issues that get kind of critical uh, aspects that will provide, uh, provide uh, in some countries uh, room to uh, trigger reforms in terms of fiscal transparency and to develop access to fiscal information. It was we seen, for instance, in uh, Mozambique, we are following a very large uh, fiscal crisis triggered by corruption uh, affairs. We had an overall of the public financial management system. So, still referring to the 2017 uh, Open Budget Survey, if we take a look at the legislative oversight on budget in the MENA region, um, you can see that mostly uh, the scores are not so, the average score are not so good, um, and that uh, legislative oversight could uh, improve. Once again, it's based on the study, it's based on their benchmarks, but it gives you a sense about what is the average uh, performance in the region, and you can see that Egypt is in the, below the sailing of 40, so meaning uh, some improvement can be made. If we take a look at key aspects of Parliament oversight and budget, uh, we can have broadly five key categories. Uh, the first one is the quality and the importance of the debate on budget policy prior to the budget itself. The trend currently is to have at some point a discussion, mostly after three months, four months before tabling the budget, on the main <coughs> options that will underpin the preparation of the budget by the government. Um, in many countries, it's the case we want to prepare the future, have an early engagement with the Parliament. And why it's uh, important? Because it will provide sufficient time to review the budget pro draft budget tabled by the government. And also, the second aspect of oversight, the Parliament needs to have sufficient time to review the budget and to uh, analyze it. Usually, we consider that two to three months is a good period. I know in many countries, the constitutions provide different periods and so on, but we consider that two to three months is the right period to have a meaningful analysis of the budget. It's we, international standards, consider that it's a meaningful period. Third aspect is the question of scrutiny. Uh, it's important to have the parliament analyzing the budget, but what does it mean? It means that first you need to have a discussion at the level of the sectors, the de depending of how you are organized, but let's say you have, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, the parliament in Egypt, but let's say you have a commission in charge of culture, a commission in charge of interior uh, committees, and the committees should first have a look at the budget for the sectors they are dealing with, and a real review of the budget. And then you have, of course, the budget committee, which is in charge mostly of the general equilibrium of the budget and the main fiscal options. Five, fifth aspect is the question of in your monitoring of budget execution. It should be a key responsibility of the government, of the parliament, to be able to work with the government to have a major review in place, meaning the Ministry of Finance and the government prepare a major review showing what has happened since the uh, adoption of the budget, what are the new events. Budget at the end of the day is just uh, an educated guess on the future, but after six months you have a better idea about what will happen with the budget, and to have this monitoring effective in place with a discussion at the Parliament of the major review. And the fifth aspect is the question of uh, being able to work with the Supreme Audit Institution to assess uh, its report and its implication. The Parliament has granted at the beginning of the year an authorization to spend public money. So what has happened? What are the results? And what's the view of the Supreme Audit Institution, which should, should be independent about what has been done with public money during the fiscal year? So just to conclude, um, when we take a look at uh, the, the outcomes and the situation created by the global financial crisis, um, uh, what we see is mostly we have uh, now in most of the countries more um, emphasis on looking, as I mentioned many times, outside the single, the, the uh, sole budget. Countries are looking more and more at the overall public sector pictures, including some national governments, including uh, public corporations. Second aspect is the question of uh, fiscal risk. Uh, it's a role of the Ministry of Finance and the Line Ministries to manage the fiscal risk, but it's also their role to provide information to the Parliament on the way uh, these risks are identified, uh, monitored, and what are the mitigation measures 
it's important to put in place mechanism to be able to control the risk. Uh, for instance, if you have guarantees, what is the framework for granting guarantees? How do you assess the risk of the guarantees and how you can uh, cope with them if they materialize? It's important when you have uh, the design of uh, public financial management system to make sure that you have information on the past. So financial statement at the end of the year with the support of the supplement institution to review them. On the present, mid-year review, especially it's a very important topic. And on the future, the budget. What the budget is providing as information, what the per performance of uh, budget in terms of comparison between what was foreseen at the beginning of the year and what has been implemented. And last point, uh, I would say that in many countries, the parliament should be a key player of this. For what? Because it's a first a major user of information, and it's also a main enabler, meaning it's setting the rules for public finance. So it's a key responsibility of the parliament to express clear uh, guidance, I would say, to the government about its expectations. Uh, I've seen in many countries uh, Ministry of Finance preparing a lot of information, sometimes too much information, but without a clear understanding about the needs of the Parliament. Sometimes it's because they don't do the extra mile to see what, uh, what is needed, but most of the time it's simply because the Parliament do not provide clear expectation about the information. So I guess it's a really a kind of dynamic relationship to develop to make sure that the Parliament is playing a, a role in terms of developing fiscal transparency. I will stop here. I've been a little bit longer than foreseen. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this.